All right, they tell me this thing is on now. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to my presentation today. Uh, we're going to be talking about labels and data, how to achieve B2B supply chain excellence. Uh, my name is Peter Zielinski. I am a supply chain geek. Actually, I'm a supply chain technology consultant working for barcoding. Um, I've been in the industry for a long time, and um, this is about one of my favorite pet peeves. So let's have some fun. Um, what I do is I perform operational assessments, among other things, to help customers find out what their targets is and set baselines for where they're currently at. Um, whether it's going to be a continuous improvement project or a full-blown digital transformation, I like to make sure all parties are prepared for this. So part of that involves paying attention to the people, the process, the technology, and the data behind all of that. If you're not paying attention to all four things, you're going to fall flat on your face somewhere along the line because there's going to be gaps in your process or in your understanding of what's actually happening. And the whole purpose of a digital transformation had better be to reduce your costs, improve your cash flow, or improve that customer experience. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about all three of those, and improving that customer experience may require some definition. So that will be part of our presentation today. If I'm talking too fast, raise a hand, slow me down, because uh, we've had a little caffeine today. It's all good. So our objectives. We're going to start with why. I want you to be able to identify fairly easily what B2B excellence looks like in the supply chain. I want you to understand what I mean about improving the customer experience and have that in a way that you can take it home and explain it to other people in case you don't already have a good grasp on that. And we're going to be talking about using GS1 standards as a platform for success. Uh, GS1 standards allow you to capture, share, and use data not only within your four walls or within your enterprise, but across your supply chain. And working with standards means that we're all talking about the same things at the same time. So I'm going to kind of give us a storyline to set this up. So I want you to imagine that you are in a production line. It's a production center. You're in manufacturing. And you have a sudden stock outage. Now, it's not a part that you need to produce things. It's a part that you need to run your manufacturing line. So this is a maintenance and repair operation crisis. The, the production line is down. That means you're losing about $10,000 per minute because product is not moving through your factory. So we've elevated the stakes a little bit to kind of raise the uh, awareness of what's happening with us. So what we need is one of these. It's an actuator motor. And uh, what is your B2B experience like if you need something like this in a hurry, if there is a stock outage? I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. So here we are. Here's our production line. It's not moving. Maintenance needs a part. And we know we're waiting. Well, there's more than that. The production line is down. And like I said earlier, it's costing us about $10,000 a minute because we can't get product out the door. Uh, we've ordered the parts. It's arriving today because we have a regular order coming in. They just threw it on the back of the truck for us. And this line has got to resume by end of day today. Fairly straightforward. Now, when it gets to the receiving dock, what's the experience going to be like? Because that's really what we're focused here on. Um, that pallet's going to arrive. And when it arrives, the case that we need is somewhere on that pallet. We don't know where. Inside one of those cases is a package. Inside one of those packages is the part that we need. This is reality, right? Especially if it's showing up on a mixed pallet. So this is a classic needle in the haystack problem. We've got all these things, and they're somewhere here. That's going to slow down the receiving process. And again, it's costing us $10,000 a minute. Right? We've all seen this before. What do we have to do? Well, the guys in receiving, probably your receiving manager, has got to go through all of these steps on pretty much everything that comes in the door. If the product does not make it into your ERP system, it can't be used because no one knows where it is. It can't be billed out, right? So if it doesn't get counted, it doesn't get put away, it can't get expedited. So all these things have to occur. Now, in a manual-based system, how long are you going to wait? Now, I know from my experience and from industry experience, most small businesses generally do receiving in the morning, somewhere between 8 and noon. And they do their shipping in the afternoon, somewhere between 12 and 5, right? That's kind of a standard operating procedure. And it takes about one to four hours for them to get through this whole process of doing receiving. Now, we're going to set up our scenario to make it a best case scenario. But if you're going to run through this, you're going to receive and unload the pallet, inspect and validate that bill of lading, and make sure it matches a purchase order that you've got, because you don't want the wrong pallet. Um, then you've got to inspect the goods, make sure that what's there matches what's on the order, check the quality, because if there's damaged cartons, you don't want to accept them, right? And then you're going to enter this information into your ERP system, check things off, and put it away or expedite it. Now, I know for a fact, 
it's probably not going to go into your ERP system directly. Somebody's going to take that and put it in somebody else's inbox, right? So in many operations, even though they receive the product today, it's not in inventory until either later in the day or sometime tomorrow. Am I right? OK. So again, this whole process could take one to four hours. For our scenario, we're going to set up to a best case scenario. We're going to say, OK, it's the last pallet on the truck, so it's the first pallet off, right, because it's a rush order. And because it's a rush order, that carton is somewhere near the top of the stack. Let's say it's five layers deep, it's in layer one or two, so they should be able to get to it fairly quickly. But if it's a manual receiving process with a lot of paperwork, it's going to take somewhere between one and four hours on average. Now, if this was an automated receipt process, that means you've got a warehouse management system in play, and you're making use of advanced shipping notices so that you know what's coming to you from the people that you ordered your product, right? They told you, you, or, you told them, send me this product and I'll pay you for it. They said, we're sending you this product and here it's coming and here's all the information that goes along with that. That's part of that process. So an automated receipt process is going to go a little bit faster because there's a lot less touches involved. I don't have to touch the paperwork if my scan gun can scan the barcode. I'm going to acknowledge that shipment being received and take it to where it needs to go. This is going to take less than 20 minutes on average to get a pallet off that truck and where it needs to be. And I'll go into that in some detail. But the idea here is if you're using GS1 standards, you can be a lot more efficient, a lot more accurate, and we'll get into why. So my example of B2B excellence involves these different parts. Um, that pallet has the SSCC barcode on it. That is a serialized shipping container code. You guys have all seen it, and I'll show you a picture of that shortly. But that's what's on that pallet to identify it as a unique transaction between the shipper and our business. Now, when it's received at the dock, it's going to be scanned into my warehouse management system. And my warehouse management system already knows it's coming. It's not a mystery. It's something we ordered. And I'm going to be able to direct that to a rush location because I know what's on that order. And my system's going to optimize where that goes. All the cases are going to get scanned for handling, because I don't know which one it is. As soon as I reach that case that needs to be expedited, my gun's going to go off, vibrate in my hand, and say, this needs to go someplace special. Okay? And I'm pretty sure maintenance is going to be standing somewhere near the dock doing one of these numbers looking for their part, right? It's going to be pretty typical, because $10,000 a minute, it's costing them. So again, our time elapsed is going to be typically 20 minutes or less. I'd like to do the math on this one. Now remember, we're elevating the situation up because it's a out of stock uh, maintenance and repair operation that's dependent upon this. So there are some incidental costs outside of just the receiving process. It's costing us $10,000 a minute. So if you were to try to do a Six Sigma on your receiving operation to figure out how much each thing costs you to do, you got to check your paperwork, you got to do all of your receiving operations, you could probably get done with the study inside of two to six days and come up with some numbers. But to me, if you're going to do back of the napkin math, how much is someone else going to charge you to do the same thing is a really good estimate about how much it's going to cost you. And if you're going to have a third party logistics company, a 3PL, handle your inventory, they're going to charge you $45 an hour to move your stuff around, to bring it off of a truck, put it in inventory, label it, and bring it back out to you. So let's use that for our standard, $45 an hour. So again, how much is it going to cost? I want to estimate this, so I'm going to estimate it using the idea of touches. I'm going to say, every time I touch something, we're going to just charge a minute to that transaction. Sometimes it'll be more, sometimes it'll be less, but I want to get a rough estimate on how much this is going to cost. Do the math, it comes out to about 75 cents a touch. My best case manual receipt is about 27 minutes, and I'll show you why. My best case GS1 automated receipt, actually not the best, but using the exact same steps, is going to be about 13 minutes or half the time. Half the time, I don't care how you want to calculate it, means half the cost. In this case, we're saving about $140,000 because we've elevated it with the line being down. And you're like, okay, Pete, where's your math? Prove it to me. Um, for those of you in the back, you may have to get up and walk around a little bit because it, it is kind of small. But I said, these are all the steps that have to be done. The difference between these two is the steps that don't have to be done. I don't have to apply for a bill of lading. I get it. I put it into my in-bin. I don't have to look through it. I just have to recognize that I've received it. I don't have to search for a PO because my warehouse management system is going to scan that barcode and go, oh, I know what this is. Here's where it needs to go. And it's going to go directly from receiving the pallet to expediting it. That pallet's going to get moved to a drop location where somebody knows this is a rush. Get it done. So the other steps that are missing in here is checking the ERP system and, and doing a line-by-line -line validation of everything that's on that pallet. 
If you're using GS1 standards, you have a trusted relationship with your providers. They're giving you information because they know you're going to be giving them money. There's a relationship established there, and you're going to take advantage of that relationship by collaborating and making both of your jobs easier. That's the whole purpose behind GS1 standards, and that's kind of what we're going to get into today. Oops, wrong button. Let's try forward. So now that we've talked about costs, if we're using GS1 standards for receiving, what are those benefits? I could step through this fairly shortly, but I want you to notice uh, the things that are in red, the serialized shipping container code, that starts off on the supplier's side. That is a service the supplier is giving the customer. If you are that shipper, that's a service you can give your customers if you're not already doing that. And I'm going to bet all of you are already doing that, and I'll show you why. Um, but the WMS, that's on your customer's side. They have to be able to consume and absorb that information so that their processes can become more efficient. So they do have that prerequisite. Um, they also have, to have some processes in place, such as knowing that if there is a rush location that their WMS is set up to expedite products accordingly. So there is some SOPs involved in this too. But all the cases get scanned for handling, that rush item gets expedited, and Lori B, it takes 20 minutes or less. That's our standard for B2B excellence. And the benefits of those standards are fairly straightforward. Reduced inefficiency. You're never going to eliminate it, but you can reduce it. Because you're using improved product information that's shared throughout the supply chain, you get enhanced traceability because we're all talking about the same products in motion. Electronic order management is how we're supporting all of that. And we're using automatic data capture to keep things more efficient, more accurate, and more connected so that we get the enhanced inventory visibility that we need, not only within the four walls, but also across the supply chain. And that's my definition of operational excellence. So busy slide. We're all talking about Industry 4.0 and digital transformation. GS1 standards, oops, let me back up. GS1 standards support that whole thing for digital transformation because it's very data intensive. Uh, how many people know the phrase G-I-G-O? Garbage in, garbage out, right? So unless you've got good data governance, um, you can't support Industry 4.0. You can crawl, walk, run, but you're ne never going to get past crawl without having good data standards. So I want to talk a little bit about the supply chain versus the value chain. The supply chain, in my point of view, is all of the businesses along the way from procurement way up front, raw materials, all the way down through the retail end or the customer side of things. Each one of the businesses along the way, whether it's a manufacturer, a distribution company, a distribution center, a retailer, a wholesaler, each one of those is an element of your supply chain for that whole product line. The value chain is how you add value or extract profit along the way, how you become a more profitable company. So reducing your costs means you can make more money off that differential, right? Or maybe charge your customer less and sell them more. You want ways of improving your cash flow. Otherwise, why bother doing digital transformation? If it's not going to make you money, why bother, right? GS1 standards support this and allow you to do a whole lot more with your industry uh, than you would otherwise. So I want to illustrate a little bit about that whole value chain concept. And this is a little hard to read, so I, even I'm going to have to move up on this. Um, along this side, we're talking about those elements of the value chain. And they're listed upstream, manufacturing, warehousing, transport, retail, fulfillment, use by the clients, and end of life. And this comes from a GS1 slide called uh, Business Trends in the GS1 Value Train. Now, the business trends across the top here, um, that's part of that digital transformation concept, things everybody's trying to push for right now. Data security and privacy, number one. Traceability, number two. Uh, third up, we're talking about greenness and sustainability. Um, On-demand logistics and services. Automation and smart everything, so getting into IoT. And the last two business trends are empowered consumers and mass customization, sometimes known as 3D printing. Um, GS1 standards are relevant to every aspect of that value chain, but there's a sweet spot in here. Manufacturing, warehousing, transport, retail, and fulfillment. That is a sweet spot because it's all about traceability, sustainability, and data privacy and security. That's where GS1 standards give you a huge return on your investment. So these GS1 standards, what are we talking about? So we're talking about a common language to capture, identify, share, and use information. And by identify, uh, we're referring to the people, places, things, and events that are a part of your supply chain. Sharing those activities is important. 
capturing it involves usually automated data capture, barcode scanning, RFID, these types of technologies. But the whole purpose of this is so that you can share that actionable data. And you're going to do that using a common language. They're calling it EPCIS, which means Electronic Product Code Information Services. It's just another way of writing things. It's a way of standardizing your communication from one system to the next. And CBV is common business vocabulary. What are we doing? We're talking about a disposition. Uh, what are we doing? We're talking about a shipment. We're shipping. We're receiving. We're transporting things. That's part of that common business vocabulary. And the idea of use is using it to automate your supply chain, again, within the four walls and between yourself and the, the adjacent nodes so that you've got information along that supply chain that can support your operations. So a little bit of economics 101. What does it mean to add value to a product? Um, we talk about the fact that the more differentiated you are as a retailer, as a manufacturer, the more you can sell that product for. If your product is completely different from everyone else's, you can set whatever price you want. If it's similar to someone else's, you have to have a differentiator, something that sets you apart. Value-added services are how you set things apart. And pardon me, I'm going to come up with a better example than this, but we're talking about the Starbucks model in some ways. Everyone's been to Starbucks, right? Um, you start off with raw beans. And if you're going to buy beans at Starbucks, you're going to pay a price for it. They've added some competitive position to that, so it's going to be a little bit higher up the differentiation chain. Um, if you're going to buy your, green, your ground beans, again, pricing model goes up. If you actually go there for a cup of coffee, they're going to charge you a little bit more than average for a cup of coffee because they're Starbucks. Why? You're there for the fireplace, the comfy chair, the ambiance, and the Wi-Fi. You're not just there for coffee. You're there for that entire experience. That's where that value add comes in. It's not just what they're delivering. It's how they go about delivering it to you in a way that adds value and makes your life better. Now, I want you to think about that as a customer. Do you want to deal with someone who makes your life better and takes the effort out? Or would you rather deal with somebody who makes things difficult? It's a, kind of a no-brainer question, so I apologize. Um, in the supply chain, we're talking about how do we do that? How do we improve that customer experience? Well, we do that by going ahead and adding in value-add activities, adding more information to the supply chain to make their jobs easy and more effortless, and as a supplier, so that I get paid quicker. I'm going to add barcodes to that product, RFID in some cases, or I might add information uh, using IoT devices, sensors that say, hey, by the way, this thing went through vibration while it was in transit. Are you OK with those settings? Or by the way, uh, there's a temperature fluctuation today. Um, it's still under temp, but you, know, you may want to pay close attention to this. Or better yet, hey, by the way, that shipment, um, it got stuck in traffic. The temperature is rising. You may want to order another truckload of that because I can't guarantee that it's going to arrive under good condition, right? That would be something nice to know if you're in the food industry and you're shipping refri refrigerated or frozen goods. Nothing's worse than opening up a truck full of melted ice cream, right? And if you've got sensors and data that you can share with your clients along the way, they can make better business decisions so that they can have ice cream that's actually frozen instead of ice cream that's half melted. They can return that shipment before they actually receive it. Things like that. So improving the customer experience means improving that information flow. Those value-add activities begin with customer-compliant labeling. You need to be able to identify product when it comes in your door, preferably with a barcode or an RFID code on there. And the item, the case, the case pack, the carton, and the pallet should all have standardized identifiers. If I've got a standard pallet count of 48, I want to scan a barcode and know that I picked up 48 cases. I don't want to have to say, scan this SKU 48, and then move it. One barcode to rule them all. Um, Serialized shipping container codes is a way of connecting two nodes on that supply chain, a supplier and a receiver. A serialized shipping container code has no information associated with it outside of that relationship because it's carrying that relationship along with it. It's your purchase order tied to a bill of lading, all of it electronically transmitted through an advanced shipping notice. That's what ASN stands for, and EDI, which is the electronic data interchange, so that you can tie these two systems together. Nothing's worse than getting an advanced shipping notice that's just a fax. Yeah, we sent you something. Because that doesn't help you make your job any better. It tells you that you've got something coming, but you ordered it. You had a ship date that you expected the product in. That's not really helpful. Being able to receive that product and automatically enter it into your system the moment you scan it off that dock and it appears in active inventory the moment it arrives means that you can do just-in-time processing, just-in-time shipments. 
which is what fuels the automotive industry. Everything that gets received at Toyota is pre-configured to be received at that moment. And when it's received, they've got it down to the very serial numbers on the chassis that are being transferred to that company at the moment they're received at the dock. That's pretty important. It's kind of cool stuff. And it's only because they're using GS1 standards. So GS1 standards allow you to share a lot of data that allows you to eliminate touches because you can now get your five W's, who, what, where, when, how, uh, get those questions answered within the supply chain. That saves you money. That saves everybody in the supply chain money because you're sharing that information. Um, and sharing that data starts off with what we call the item master. Uh, there's a GS1 global directory which is now called One World Sync. It is a global data synchronization network. Basically, it's a library. All of the UPC codes for your products in your supply chain should be stored up in that library so that anyone who's buying your product can get product information from a centralized source without contacting you so that you can keep all of your customers in line on what products you're producing and selling, and they've got all of the information that's associated with those products, whether it's dimensions, cut, color, clarity, pictures, weight, all of your standard pieces of information should be in that shared data repository. And below that, you can share things just within your supply chain. Think of this as at your ASNs and your EDI, and then something called EPCIS, which is event-based information, such as that ice cream is melting type stuff. Um, but that's how you start sharing your data. And again, it all starts because GS1 solves that master data problem. One World Sync handles the fact that every company has a database of all the products that you make, sell, or buy. If anything changes, any information about that changes within your supply chain, everybody's information becomes outdated. So you want some way of automatically syncing that. It's a subscription service, but it serves not only you, it serves the rest of the industry, the rest of the people in your supply chain. It's nice that we're working together and we're collaborating. But if you want to share information just between one business and the next because, oh, I don't know, um, somebody placed an order for a product, the definition of a supply chain is literally two or more parties connected by a flow of information, goods, or money. Well, we know it's not this simple. It gets a little bit more complicated than that because not only do I place an order, but I expect an order confirmation. If I don't get an order confirmation, I'm gonna order it from somebody else who does give me an order confirmation so I know my product is going to arrive. Um, when those goods are delivered, mm, the shipper is probably going to send me an invoice just to make sure that he gets paid, right? Makes sense? It's not quite that simple yet. Nowadays, people order too much sometimes, or product can arrive and be damaged. So the situation might be a little more complicated. There could be the purchase order followed by an order confirmation. The goods actually get physically delivered, which is great. I get an invoice, so I'll pay that. But you know, a week later, I realized that one of the cartons in the middle of this pallet was damaged. So I want to return merchandise authorization, and I'm going to ship that product back or get credit for it. Either way, for one purchase order, I've got nine different touches, nine transactions for one purchase order. And this is standard. This is nothing unusual, right? Um, what if I told you there was a way to get it down to just the two touches that involve actually physically moving the product from one place to the next? What's the cost of those other seven touches that you can eliminate? That's the benefits of using electronic data interchange because those seven touches can be handled automatically between two systems so that you get the product that you ordered and you put it on the shelf. You don't worry about the paperwork. You don't worry about the billing. That's handled by the back office. The shipping dock's no longer responsible for dealing with those transactions. It's part of the system. That's the benefit of using GS1 standards. And there's a huge cost take out there that doesn't often get realized, but it's huge. So EPCIS. Electronic Product Code Information Service. What are we talking about here? Well, it's really just a way of talking about an open standard for communicating things between two businesses. You're going to identify the who, what, where, when, and why of visibility events, things that actually matter, things that change, that you need to alert somebody about, whether it's the fact that they ordered 48 and you can only deliver 40, or the fact that your shipment's going to be late. Would you like to uh, order a rush shipment from another location to kind of counterpart of that. I mean, these types of things can happen electronically and automatically, but only for using GS1 standards. Now, EPCIS events have some dimensions to them, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but it's basically the what are we talking about. Global trade identifiers or serialized global trade identifiers. When did it take place so that we have order of precedence on these transactions? 
and where, who's the business that's responsible for where these events occurred? That's gonna be using a global location number. Everything within the GS1 universe has a number to identify it with, and they're all related in a really interesting way. And we'll get to that in just a few moments. So the benefits of using the EPCIS or that common business vocabulary are increased product safety through traceability. That means traceability throughout the supply chain. If I've got yogurt that's shipping and then somebody realizes that there's a high content of plastic in that product because one of my uh, processing machines was starting to break down while I was producing that, I can now send out a recall notice. And we can stop that within the supply chain or put alerts in your WMS to pull that product without me having to make a phone call to tell you about it. Wouldn't that be great? Know not to sell product that's damaged so that you get it out of the supply chain quickly. Um, it's also going to in increase your on-shelf product availability, that whole just-in-time shipment concept so that you don't have so much safety stock. Um, increased counterfeit protection because we now know the providence of that product as it moves through the supply chain, and we can tell when it's been interrupted. And if we've got serialization on there, we can verify the serial numbers that we received are the same as the ones that were shipped to us because it should be part of that. And again, improve theft protection. But all of this gives us much more data for analytics, which allows us to improve our business because now we'll have more data about what we're doing. So this global language of business starts off with some nouns and verbs. Most of our nouns are identifiers. Global data synchronization network. We talked about that already. That's our uh, GS1 one world sync concept. Then we're starting to talk about the global location number because everything starts somewhere with some who. If we're gonna ship products, we're gonna use a serialized shipping container code to identify that product in motion between me and the person who ordered it, or between whoever supplied it and my doc. And GTINs are something that we share across the supply chain. That's your UPC code. In B2B, you don't need a UPC code, you need a GTIN. The difference between those is it's 14 digits and you can't pass it through a checkout. However, that doesn't mean the information is not valid. You can still process a UPC code without being a retailer. Nothing wrong with that. But the whole concept behind GTINs is a standardized product identifier that ties that product to a manufacturer. A serialized GTIN is that precisely down to the each. So if you're gonna serialize something, use a serialized GTIN, and then they've got one barcode to scan to trace that product throughout the entire supply chain. It's kind of fun. So, a little bit more details here. Now that we've talked about our initial shipping scenario, we've identified the pallet with a serialized shipping container code. So, step one. Step two, let's see what that serialized shipping container code looks like. It's got three parts to it. Every trading partner you have has a different set of details they want you to put in this middle segment here. If you're shipping to Amazon, they want one thing. If you're shipping to Target, they want another thing. If you're shipping to a automotive manufacturer, that middle segment might be which line it's going to. But a few things are never gonna change. Um, it's always gonna have a from and a to, and the from is always gonna be on this side, and the to is always gonna be on that side, and it's gonna have a serialized shipping container code. So just a quick show of hands, how many people see that going out their shipping dock every day? Right? So if you're using a serialized shipping container code, you already are subscribing to GS1 standards. Whether or not you're using them within the four walls may not matter as much, but the ROI is there. What you're doing is you're participating in the logistics effort portion of that. If you're not using it on both ends, you're not taking advantage of something you're already paying for. So um, we now identify all of the cartons. The cartons could also have their own little license plate, or they could have a GS1128 content label. Um, how many people have been scanning barcodes for years? On any given product, how many barcodes do you generally scan? Well, you're gonna scan the item number, you're gonna scan the lot number, you might scan a quantity, right? Using GS1 standards, all that information is in one single barcode. So now instead of scanning three or four different barcodes, it might be in different positions on different labels depending on who's supplying it, you get to scan one barcode, GS1128. Um, you also wanna be able to identify those case packs inside the box because you're gonna put those on the shelf, right? Well, they've gotta have their own little labels and that label will be a GS1128 content label. And God willing, when somebody manufactured that item, they put an indelible marking on there that had a serial number along with an identifier that said, this is what it is. So that when you pull that damaged product or that damaged part 
off the line and you have to replace that motor, you know where it came from, you know when you bought it, when you purchased it, and you can track that information down to make yourselves more efficient, more accurate, and more connected. Now we've identified everything along our supply chain from the item unit all the way through to the logistics unit, which is our serialized shipping container code. That's pretty much what GS1 standards are about at, in a nutshell. Being able to use this information is another challenge. But if you can use this information, you don't have to relabel when products come in your door. How many people put their own company's item or SKU number on products that come in the door? Right? Because you get it from more than one manufacturer? How would you like to be in the hospital industry where you buy gauze from 45 or 50 different companies? It's still a piece of four inch, 100% cotton gauze, right? But it comes in with a different SKU from every manufacturer. Well, how about you just use the number they gave you and have a set of aliases so that it's going to come across your system when they scan it as four inch gauze rather than being Joe Blow's four inch gauze? Because you really don't care. As long as you've got inventory control over this and you can scan those numbers, your life becomes a lot more simple if your system can consume the values you share within your supply chain. That's what the purpose of being able to capture, share, and use that information is. So the benefits of GS1 standards are reduced inefficiencies. You're never going to stamp it out, but you can reduce the incidents. You've got improved product information because now we're all sharing the same information. If the manufacturer comes out with a new carton size, same product, but instead of eight in a box, he's now shipping 12 in a box. When that thing comes across your dock door, you scan the barcode, you now you know you've got 12. You don't have to open the box to count it. Your system's automatically in sync. That's an awesome thing. Electronic order management has to be part of this process. And using automatic data capture to support electronic order management, again, and so forth. Again, this is my idea of operational excellence. B2B operational excellence involves using the information that's available or making more information available so we can all share it to be better. So who's using this stuff now? Well, if you think back to 1973, the very first UPC code was scanned at a grocery store in Ohio. It's a pack of Wrigley's gum. That started off this whole thing. Retail uses GS1 standards to become more efficient because they really have small margins. They're looking for every possible way of saving money. Who else is trying to save money and become more efficient? The automotive industry. GS1 standards allow them to have just-in-time manufacturing from more suppliers than I care to count, right? They've got a multitude of suppliers shipping stuff to them on a daily basis that is just in time, just what they need to manufacture that day so that they can reduce their carrying costs. Anything that arrives that day is going to be on a car or an automobile by the end of the day for the most part. There's not a whole lot in stock, and they don't have storage for inventory on stock. They have a place to manufacture cars. They're not storing parts for cars. So the automotive industry is one of our uh, innovators within the supply chain. They're also one of our innovators when we think of GS1 standards as a technology. So I want you to think about that. GS1 standards are an information technology. It's not a physical device. It's a way of communicating and sharing information amongst your suppliers. It's a part of that collaborative relationship. And the adoption of that GS1 standard follows the typical curve. So right down here, we have our innovators. If you think about this as a number of innovators, think retail, think automotive. The early adopters, that first bump, that's everybody who's supplying the automotive industry or the retailers. They're early adopters because they have compliance issues, right? I can't sell to Ford unless I put the right labels on there and subscribe to their information system. The early majority, it's a huge group of people because they're related to those other people and they're taking advantage of standards that are already in play. If my shippers are sending me or have the capability of sending me automated shipping notices because they're re establishing that relationship already with other partners, then I can take advantage of that. But where is the rest of the B2B world? Well, let's be honest, the rest of us are in this late majority or laggards. How do I know? The WERC did a study recently. One third of all manufacturing and retail facilities that have inventory do not have a warehouse management system. They're using paper. If you're using paper, there is no way on earth you're using GS1 standards except possibly for logistics because your UPS or FedEx machines, whatever, actually print that label for you. But you're still participating in the GS1 because of some information that you have to have. Um, let's talk about the challenges of adopting that new technology of GS1 standards and what's going to slow this down. Uh, 
barcoding did our own study recently. Um, ours was entitled um, Android Migration by the Numbers because we were studying the technological change of going from either Windows CE devices and mobile mobility to the Android platform. And we said, okay, we've got a whole bunch of supply chain geeks. Let's survey them and find out what their answers to these questions are. Well, back that up. Um, Number one thing, number one challenge for adopting new technology was finding an ROI or financial justification for it. That's the number one reason you don't move ahead with a technological solution, because you can't afford it or you can't justify it. Number two was integration of back-end systems. GS1 standards are designed to make your operation more efficient, more accurate, and more connected by connecting you to the supply chain. The financial ROI and that back-end integration type thing is built in. Those problems are solved up front. Now, that doesn't mean there's no lift, because there is. I'm not going to lie to you. You have to get a WMS. There's a painful process of going from paper to barcode scanning and RFID. But everyone's done it somewhere along the way. It's not rocket science anymore. So if you're looking for your ROI, you're going to find it in this bump. Be across the value chain, you're looking for things like sustainability, uh, recycling, reuse, reusable totes, things that you can identify and reuse again and again. Traceability, having that end-to-end -end traceability in the pharmaceutical industry is now a legal requirement. Uh, and the food industry is getting pretty close to that. So GS1 standards involve three things. Actually four, but one is standards for identification, which no one can see because I'm going to blow this up in a moment. Standards for identifying that using machine-readable tools, such as barcodes or RFID tags. And last but not least, we kind of talked about this, the master data sharing, the transactional data sharing for EDI, and the event data. Um, I totally stole this slide from the GS1 organization. So if you're looking for this information, look up GS1 standards, and you'll find this poster everywhere. So those GS1 fundamentals that I was talking about, if you look at a 14-digit GTIN, the very center part of that is your GS1 company prefix. That GS1 company prefix is the fundamental thing you need to participate in the GS1 standards. And you are probably already doing that because somewhere in your company you have a certificate like this because dun, 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 you have a global location number and you have a company prefix because it appears on your SSCC barcodes right here. Your company prefix is these digits somewhere between the zeros. So if you've got labels like this coming out of your company, you have a company prefix. The rest of it's just incremental steps that you need to take to take advantage of belonging to the GS1. So we need to be able to identify people, places, and things. Let me walk this entire supply chain from the manufacturer all the way down to the patient consumer for you and show you what we're talking about. I'm going to have a lot of acronyms up here, and I'm going to break them down. So global location number, your GLN, that identifies the who or the where. GTIN is our, whoops, back it up. GTIN, Global Trade Identification Number. That's your UPC code. Or in your case, if it's business to business where you don't have to have a retail code on there, it's still a code 128 barcode that they can scan to identify the product anywhere in the supply chain. Uh, you can have GTINs on all the different packaging sizes, but if you're shipping it to someone, you're probably going to give it a serialized shipping container code so that they know it's theirs, and they know what purchase order it came in on and when it's going to be received. Now, if you happen to have pallets that are reusable and recyclable because you've got reusable totes, that's going to have a GRAI, which is a Global Returnable Asset Identifier. That allows you to track that within the system as well. The reason we're using all these names is sometimes our totes end up in a place they shouldn't be. But they're going to have my number on there, and if you're a member of the GS1, you can actually pop on there, type that number in, and it will report back whose it is so that you can return that product. Last but not least, this manufacturer has their own trucks for transit. Could be a panel van, could be a, a, a truck of some sort. It's going to have a GIAI so that you can connect all of the things that they put on the truck with the truck itself. That's a global individual asset identifier. This same model gets repeated along the supply chain. So when it reaches a distributor, they have their own global location number. It could be a from or a to, but that's their number. If they have their own transport, they have a global individual asset identifier. And the products that they're shipping, um, have that manufacturer's GTIN on it. They don't need to relabel it. It's got that original GTIN to identify it. Now, when it reaches the distribution center, it's got a serialized shipping container code, and when they transport it, it's going to have another code. Remember, this SSCC barcode is only between this distributor and this retailer. It doesn't have any information that anybody else cares about. Again, 
this SSCC barcode establishes a relationship between these two endpoints connected to a bill of lading and connected to a purchase order, or 10. There's one element in here that we haven't talked about yet, and that is that little green Martian there on the end. That's our consumer or a patient or a caregiver. Why would I have a global service relationship number attached to a caregiver? Well, pharmaceuticals are tracked from end to end now at a serialized dosage level. The very last person in that supply chain is the doctor who gives you that medication or the nurse who's applying that. They are now part of that supply chain and they have traceability over that operation for patient safety. So GS1 fundamentals start off with identifying the people, places, and things that are important to us. And the rest of it's sharing that information. Now the bonus now is we've gotten way beyond the UPC. We're now talking about data-rich attributes. So I've got more information in this barcode than just the identifier of what the product is. I also may have a count. I might have the lot number, the lot code, the catch weight. Any attribute you can associate with that inventory item could be stored right there. Now I could be using RFID to share that information across my supply chain. That's going to get tied in. That RFID ID is going to get tied into that bill of lading and that material that's being transmitted electronically. Now I can also use a two-dimensional barcode that keeps it machine readable but allows me to see more of what the people need to see on my labels than what the machines need to see. If I'm looking for this particular product, which label would I rather be looking at? I'd much rather know that it's 15 units of one gallon of floor cleaner than try to read it off of this label. So again, we've gotten well beyond that UPC code. Now I want you to recognize GS1 fundamentals are trying to get down to that unit level traceability, like we said, for pharmaceuticals. You can do that with an RFID tag, but you can just as easily do that with a two-dimensional barcode or even a single linear barcode. You can get unit level traceability. That's kind of the holy grail of tracking. Everything that I produce can be tracked down to an each. And if you've paid attention to some of the technology that's been presented this week, there's really interesting ways of going about and identifying things at the each level that totally go beyond barcodes and RFID. But this is the place we have to start. So GS1 standards are a platform for sharing. The whole purpose of them is to be able to support that digital transformation so that we can be more efficient, more accurate, and more connected with our supply chain and save money as a whole. I'm not just doing this for myself. I'm taking advantage of my neighbors doing things for themselves, so that, like a neighborhood. We're all sharing a common road. And GS1 standards are an enabling technology. It's another building block like 5G or cloud or robotics or AI or some of the other things we've seen here at Modex. All of these enabling technologies are stronger in combination. GS1 standards support data governance. Data governance is vitally important because otherwise your technologies will basically stumble. They'll be inefficient because they're not working with good data. All of these things together um, allow us to have a much better situation as time goes on. All of these different innovations eventually become infrastructure. And if you take a look up here, you can see some of the infrastructures that used to be rocket science or fantasy. And we've got the World Wide Web. We've got smartphones, GS1 standards, public and private clouds, CubeSats being thrown up into space, little tiny satellites just for the purpose of uh, sharing information. And there's a lot of other things coming down the way. They're all going to be parts of our infrastructure as time goes on. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and your attention. And I would like to invite you to stop by the barcoding booth, which is 4615, kind of diagonal down there, and talk with the rest of my team. Uh, we are supply chain experts, and we supply a lot of digital technology to people, everything from scanners and printers to RFID systems. And we have a lot of business partners because no one company can do them all. But we'll take a look at your people, your processes, your technology, and the data behind it, and try to guide you down a good path. We're not interested in just selling widgets. We want to help you as a company to become better, more efficient, more accurate, and more connected. So again, thank you very much. These last 45 seconds are yours. Have yourselves a wonderful day.